Yes. Good, good, okay. So <clears throat> my background is uh, I have been in marketing for around about uh, 20 years. Uh, I moved into digital marketing um, maybe about 15 years ago because it was more quantifiable and because you could uh, get a lot more information back and also you could uh, share messages with anybody anywhere in the world without having to be a huge multinational company. Um, I, over this time, have been picked up on by the Chartered Institute of Marketing, which is this previous one because I'm a lecturer in the subject, and also by uh, Google. Uh, I lecture um, for mainly for the UK and Europe for Google's Digital Garage uh, Education Initiative in order to help small businesses and uh, small companies um, promote themselves to using digital marketing and using digital tools. I also run a few agencies. The agency that I started um, initially was called Encore Video, which is online corporate video production, and, uh, and that was just to deal with the uh, shrinking attention spans of people online using video instead of text or still images to gain more engagement. That was, a, that was about five years ago. And then about three years ago, I started to move in the direction of uh, virtual and augmented reality. And I created a sister company called Encore Reality. And, uh, and it deals with the practical applications of this new technology in a number of different industries, many of which actually represent uh, the industries that you uh, are in today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a process. I always like to do this. This is typical marketer. Uh, David, David, can you be a bit louder? Uh, people are not. Yeah, here. of course. Of course. Is that a little bit quiet? <laughs> is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Now. No problem. I will shout. <laughs> um, okay, so <clears throat> the uh, what I'm going to do today, which is a very typical marketer thing to do, is I'm going to show you the trends. And the trends, of course, are where things were in the past and where things have progressed to uh, now, and then how to predict what's going to happen in the future by following that line. So what I'm just going to start with is uh, the early days of uh, media. I'll go through this quite quickly. Uh, basically, if we go back to original billboards and printing and so forth the media, that was around about 1835 that they started getting into lithographs and color printing and so forth. This is an early poster for uh, P.T. Barnum's uh, circus. Then we got to uh, the um, 1901, which you can possibly just see there, and that was Marconi uh, effectively perfecting radio transmission across the Atlantic. And then when we get into 1927, we start to see a pattern emerging. The amount of time, and this is television, this is uh, the, the first uh, uh, television broadcast by John Logie Baird, who was a fellow Scotsman. Um, the time between these different events is halved. Okay? So the time between billboards and radio and radio and television is half the time. Moving on to this, we're starting to uh, look at, so basically what I'm talking about here is that the, uh, the, the movement of media from one media to the next grows exponentially. It's, a, it's an upward growing curve. And we, we just happen to be in the next state of that curve. And it's going to be quite fast. Um, and it will continue to get faster. So looking at this, here's the, here's the different forms of media that we're familiar with. So we have things like newspaper, billboard, radio, and television. And these are all one-to-many kind of systems, okay? One newspaper read by many readers, one billboard, many people will see it, one radio advert, many people will hear it, and one television uh, advert, many people will see it. That's fine, but it's not very, um, it's not very focused. And we don't like that in marketing, and that's obviously my original background. We like to segment our audiences and make sure that it's the right person receiving the right message at any given point. And this lends itself to any form of communication, not just marketing. So again, let's go back and look at some of the original computers. Now, originally with computers, you had maybe one computer for code breaking and that kind of thing in each country. Then it moved to one in each city. These were still supercomputers, or what so they called them at the time. Then eventually one in each library, then one in each home with the advent of the microcomputer, the home computer, or the PC, the personal computer. Then one in each briefcase with the laptop, then one in each uh, pocket with the mobile phone. And now we're wearing them on our wrists, we're, we're wearing them on our heads. So basically what's happening is that now there's more than one, there's maybe between two and three computer devices for each individual on the planet. So that speed of uptake has grown, also grown exponentially. The, the, the differences in time between these different 
computer innovations between them getting smaller and nearer to us and more common to us as half each time. <clears throat> Even looking at the way that the internet works, the internet is an amazing thing, but when I first started about 15 years ago using it, well, 20 years ago using it, it was very much a one direction thing. It was, you would have your person on the left here, would put a message up online, that message would stay static for a year or two, maybe three years, and the people on the other end would just receive it. With the advent of web, 2.0, the communication became very much omnidirectional so that people would expect to have the ability to talk back. People would expect to have the ability to talk to each other. And this has had an impact not just on computers and the internet, but in the way that we think as people, as consumers, as, as workers, as employers and employees, everything becomes two-way. If you look at things like social media, for instance, these are very good examples of this because these are omnidirectional. These are, these are everybody's communicating with everybody. And then you look at mobile phones, they've really changed things because they now make us expect to have communication at any time that we can get communication with the client, with the business, with uh, anybody that we want 24 hours a day. That's our expectation. And again, this has affected us on a cultural level. Now, what I've noticed over the last 20 years is that the attention spans that I used to have when people would come to websites that I was helping would be anything up to three minutes. Now, at the time, I used to think, well, that's, that's hardly anything. That's a tiny attention span. But uh, <clears throat> because when you compared it to a magazine where people could be reading the thing for half an hour, it didn't seem like very long. However, now attention spans have gone down to a fraction of a second, actually, on average, the amount of time it takes to, uh, for somebody to work out whether or not they're going to stay in a website is as low as 50 milliseconds, a 20th of a second, before they've actually made their decision as to whether they're going to stay on that website or leave. So you really have to gauge them, engage them really quickly. Meanwhile, simultaneously, their expectations of control have increased. Their expectations of the ability to interact have also increased. Multiple users, that's an, another thing that we just expect through social media and so forth. And speed, we expect very high speed. Now, uh, Sampath and I were talking about the advent of uh, <coughs> 4G technology and it's rolled out in India and it's, it's rolled out very, very fast there. Well, that has a major, major impact on the uptake of hardware. Uh, and we were discussing how hardware was taken up very, very quickly in Japan and uh, China for QR codes because they had 3G technology, but in the UK and in America, I don't know about India, it didn't survive partially because we didn't have 3G. The connection speeds weren't high enough for it to work. So it, it, the actual connection speed can have a major impact on how quickly things are taken up. Now, you guys have got 4G. 4G is enough for us to actually use web-based augmented and virtual reality. So you are actually in a really, really right position right now for this to explode, which it will. <clears throat> Ease of use and simplicity is key as well. We don't want complexity that creates barriers and app-based content, like for instance, having to download an app in order to access a piece of content, that's a friction point. And that's a deal breaker for most people. They're just not gonna bother. So fortunately, Internet, uh, virtual and augmented reality is now moving to browser-based where you literally just click on a link or you pass an area or any other one-click operation and that's it, you're in. And that's a major, major necessity for this technology to work. If we go back to YouTube, that, that was, you know, the, the advent of video was a major, major move forward. And we and Cisco predicted as many as three years in advance that uh, video was going to dominate the internet by 2020. And they were right. They predicted it would have 80% of online content by 2020. Uh, they were wrong about that. It's 85%. So they actually underestimated it. But what's still missing? We're all using video. That's fine. But we can't really control the video short of fast forwarding and rewinding. And there's a certain amount of control in certain video channels. You can't really interact with it. It's very much a one person puts up the video and you watch it kind of a media, which we know people have moved beyond. They don't like. Multiple users. Can you really have multiple users in video? It tends to be, apart from what we're doing right now, most video is very much this broadcast medium where it's one person talking to one, as far as that recipient's concerned, one person. And is it really immersive? You know, this is the kind of thing that we always want next. We always want to move back into our natural comfort zone. And our natural comfort zone as human beings is, <clears throat> is to interact, is to immerse, is to have all of our senses taken care of. And video doesn't do that. 
It does a lot of things, but not everything. So along comes, well, here's what we've got so far. We can communicate with anybody anywhere in the world at any given time. That's great. So these are the advantages of what we have right now. And that's an advantage of the internet as well. And I'm going to show it, so that's an advantage of virtual reality as well, that you can take yourself into a digital environment anywhere in the world, as we're doing now. Or you can take an object, digitize it, and bring it into people's homes using augmented reality, which is great. However, up until recently, the technology wasn't very good. The graphics weren't particularly realistic. Uh, now, the graphics, this is virtual reality graphics. This is something that we were using in the North Sea just recently. I'll show you an animation of this later, it's very real. Uh, this is something that we created to recreate the Scottish Highlands, uh, again, a, a couple of months ago. And again, <clears throat> fully full motion, waves, everything. And this is another one that we uh, digitally recreated, uh, Dusan Babcock's uh, visitor center in Scotland. So it has to be realistic, it has to be believable. This is a hotel, uh, a luxury hotel that we uh, near Edinburgh that we recreated as well. Now the problem at the time was that the, the the equipment was bulky, it was expensive, people couldn't afford it. This one here, the Oculus, was launched at about eight hundred dollars, eight hundred euros, but you needed a thousand euro PC to make it work. So you're talking eighteen hundred euros for just just to have a fairly basic uh, virtual reality experience. Now, with the advent of the Oculus Go, you can buy those for less than 200 euros, less than 200 pounds. You can buy an Oculus Quest, which is a very much a state-of-the-art piece of kit for about maybe 400. So, and you don't need a PC, these things work on their own. You just buy it, out of the box, it works. Also, they used to cause nausea, and nausea is a really bad first impression for people to have. And this is a thing that we are physiologically, uh, Built designs to notice when things make us nauseous so we can avoid them because nausea means poison, right? So this is a very, very bad thing. If the technology makes you nauseous, then you're not going to want to go anywhere near it. Um, the other problem is that when you are in virtual reality, or at least initially, the, the it was dangerous. You didn't know what was physically around you and you might bang into things or injure yourself. That was common. It was also expensive, it was complex, it was tethered, we call it, where it means that it's attached to a PC, which is what we see here. But now, this is an Oculus Quest that you're seeing here. You, uh, It's untethered. You can see there's no actual cables connecting it. The little dots that you see around the headset are picking up on the, the environment around you. So if you get too close to furniture or the walls, it will bring up a kind of a wireframe of the room and show you you're about to hit the table stop. <laughs> um, also, the controllers that you can see on the right, that's fine, they're good, but you don't even need them anymore because those same cameras can pick up what your hands are doing. And from that, through a process called gesture recognition, you can control everything in that virtual environment. And you can use little gestures like pinching and, and you know, just like you do with a mobile phone uh, or a tablet to control the environment around you. They were, these things were really big, they were really bulky, and we're seeing this with the new uh, mixed reality, augmented reality headsets, which show you the world around you, and then they overlay a degree of uh, a layer of, of digital technology, a layer of digital content. Virtual reality is all digital content. The same thing has happened. They've started big, bulky, ugly, and people wouldn't wear them outside, and now, this is the newest, one of the newest ones to hit the market. It's called the Nreal. It's the size of a pair of conventional glasses. All of the processing power takes place in your mobile phone. That's a USB-C connection that you know anybody can use on any Android phone. You just connect it to the glasses, you connect it to your phone, done. And you could walk down the street in those things and nobody would even know that you weren't just wearing normal glasses. That's a big, big deal. That's really going to make make the huge difference when people are wearing these things. Apple, in about a year to a year and a half, are going to release Apple Glass, and you can bet it's going to be even more elegant than this. So that's going to cover both sides of the phone market: the Android side and the iOS side, the uh, the uh, Apple operating system side. So, what's next, though? What about texture? Things have to be fully immersive. So, how do we actually create that? What about temperature? What about picking something up and knowing that you can feel it uh, and knowing what temperature it is? Is that possible? 
well, I've been doing a lot of work with the, uh, the academia in Scotland and the Netherlands and Finland and Australia. There's all sorts of technology hitting the market. What you see here is a representation of what we call ultrasonic haptics. And that is where a small panel creates sound waves that you can feel as if there's a physical object there, even though there's nothing there, just sound waves. And the same people that have come up with this technology in Scotland and America have come up with an ability to make you feel the temperature. So you can pick up a coffee cup and you'll know whether that virtual coffee cup has hot coffee in it or cold coffee in it. You'll be able to feel the difference, even though there's physically nothing there. Next, also after glasses, we're talking contact lenses. Now this sounds like science fiction, but these things are already being built. They run off a combination of the uh, motion of your blinking, you can control them with that, but they can run off the electrolytes in your tears. Water and salt is a brilliant way to produce electricity and our eyes produce salt water. Also, this is, uh, we call this direct brain feedback, and this is gonna be the next step where we can already pick up on your brain waves and use them to control objects. The step after that is feeding the information directly into your brain, non-invasively using different uh, electrical wave patterns, uh, which we call temporal interference. You send high frequency wave patterns and, uh, together, and where they meet, it creates a lower frequency wave pattern, which actually affects your brain activity. So you can mimic colors, senses, smells, all of this, with absolutely no, you know, ready player one style gloves or outfits or anything. We're a bit further off that. So that's what those ones look like. So this is all probably sounding a little bit science fiction at the moment, but let's go into the actual practical models of how this is going to roll out. Well, first of all, the media that I showed you before, uh, for instance, radio, television, newspapers, billboards, of course, and even social media and YouTube are predominantly funded by advertising. That's how they make their money, which is fine. But actually what's most likely to happen because people have really adopted the same, uh, what's the word, um, subscription model uh, that we see in over the top television, OTT television, which is things like uh, Netflix. Uh, actually, uh, Sampa, what's the most popular uh, OTT television in, uh, in India? Is it Netflix? It's Amazon Prime and Netflix. Ah, yes, I use Amazon Prime as well a lot. And a lot of these, most of these are subscription uh, and rather than advertising based. Yeah. And that is quite popular. People. There, there are a lot of sure. Indian, yeah, there are a lot of Indian ones also, which are like Z5 and all. But uh, so what's happened is the whole uh, cable is slowly going out of India. Everything is becoming even, uh, uh, everything is becoming an app. Like Discovery has launched the app. Uh, Disney has launched the app. So everybody pays for whatever they want. It's on demand. And along with Disney, they have also bundled the uh, news channels with it. So if you pick up a yeah, if you pick up an Amazon Fire Stick or something, you will get all the news channels free to air. I mean, you don't have to pay anything. Well, there's two reasons for this. One of them is uh, people don't have the attention span to wait for advertising as they did in traditional commercial television. The other one is second screening. The ability to go, right, I'm not interested in this, out comes your phone, and <laughs> you start looking at that. So the actual value of that advertising was diminishing dramatically. Um, so therefore, we've moved into this model, and I think it's a good model. Um, and also, it's the model that's most likely to be used. I can't guarantee this, okay? This is just my supposition, having looked at the historical trends. But if you look at um, Google Stadia, that is a subscription model. And that is gaming and things like virtual reality. And instead of buying a games console and buying uh, games, you just go straight to this system. You have a controller, and that's it. Just like Netflix, you go, I want to play World of Warcraft. Suddenly, you're playing World of Warcraft. No cartridges, no nothing. This seems to me to be the most likely way that we're going to consume that media. But how does this apply to industry? Well. There's certain things that we can do. I'm just going to show because I'm aware that I'm probably running over time. Actually, how am I doing for time here, Sampa? That's okay. To... It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, I'll show you this, these videos quite briefly, but I won't show you the whole things because there's quite a few of them. Um, not so impressive so far until you see that behind this robot. It's being controlled by somebody who is just using gesture control and head control. It can see what he can see, and there is no 
reason that that communication cannot pass over great distances. The other week I was asked, well, last month I was asked to do a 5G live hairdressing demonstration where the hairdresser was in America and the person getting their hair cut oh. was in London. Oh. This was all over 5G. I know. We were a little bit worried about accidentally cutting his ear off, but, you know, it all went okay. Um, right, let me just move on to the next one. So it's not just about what you can see, it's about what you can do. This is where it gets very important. Here, as an example, we do a lot of drone-related stuff, particularly in the construction and energy industry, where you have to get up higher, you have to go to remote places and be able to actually interact or see things in detail. What you're looking at here is first-person perspective drone uh, drone views, which means that you can actually really get a sense of control. That's the man controlling the drone that was looking at the man controlling the drone. So that stuff's very exciting, but again, just exciting is it any more than a toy well actually it is because when you're going out to um for instance offshore wind farms the, the the legal requirements are that you need to have line of sight you need to be able to see the drone now they're changing the rules in europe because of this technology because you're you can see what the drone can see so you don't need to be able to stand on the ground and see the drone because you can see what the drone can see so that's changed the laws and it's meaning that now we can fly with the new hydrogen drones hydrogen powered drones that this and babcock have just released you can fly for two hours with a five kilogram payload. You can cover nearly a hundred miles round trip. Now that means no worries about line of sight. You can see what this thing is seeing as long as you can reach that signal. This is where it gets very exciting. Now this is quite rudimentary, okay? But this is the early stages of what we're gonna need for really working offshore or really working in hazardous environments. Drones with manipulators, drones with robot arms, now, look how basic this is, but then everything's basic to begin with. When you're using a combination of haptic gloves and the stuff that we saw in the first film, combined with a more advanced version of this, combined with something which can take a five kilogram payload, you can have proper hands. That means you don't have to worry about climbing anymore. You don't have to worry about being in explosive or, or high volatility environments. You can send this. You're still in control, but it's taking the risk. Right. This is the kind of technology that we use for actually controlling these, and I was lucky, lucky enough to use this setup. Um, it's called a uh, haptics uh, gloves. So I've just clicked through. It's about halfway through. Yeah, there we go. So those are the gloves that you wear, and those gloves have got uh, resistors in there. So when when I was picking up the rock, I could feel the rock. I could feel the weight of the rock. I could feel the texture of the rock because there are hundreds of micro pneumatics in every fingertip and right across the palm of my hands. So there was a point where I picked up a fox. Here's the fox. Let's see if we can uh, see him on the hands. I could feel his paw prints on my hands. It was that accurate. It was absolutely stunning. And this technology already exists. And now instead of being tethered to a big, PC that you can see down there, you wear it, and very soon you won't even need to wear those at all. Now, if you're using that to control a remote drone, that's that's a big deal. Okay, so where are the applications? Because in marketing, we don't sell things just for the sake of selling them. We learn where the need is and how we can solve the need. So we looked at surgery, we looked at training, and surgical training in general is a major uptake area for this kind of technology because instead of working on a cadaver on a dead body in order to learn how to be a surgeon, you can work on a, a digital facsimile of a living body. The heart is beating, the blood is pumping. You can feel the heat. It behaves in the way that a real live patient would behave and it's unlimited. And it can see what you've done right, what you've done wrong and play it back to you. None of this you can do with the cadaver. The cadaver is dead. It doesn't behave like a normal human being. They're rare, they're expensive, they're hard to get and they don't give you any feedback. All of this can be achieved with virtual reality. Telementoring means that you can actually have a surgeon in another country joining you in this virtual surgical suite and taking you through the process without having to physically travel there. Therefore, you can also have remote surgery. Now, as you can see here, 
the uh, the surgical device does not look like a surgeon. It looks like a series of robotic arms. And what these guys on the left are looking into are akin to microscopes. What they're doing is microsurgery. And again, with 5G and enough backup redundancies, so that if one goes down, there's many others to pick up again. You could. There's no reason why you couldn't uh, actually perform surgery in somebody at a great distance away. Which means that one specialist surgeon could be carrying out surgery in many different countries in the same day. Which could save many lives. Next, I'm very fond of offshore engineering. I live in Scotland. We have a very a thriving offshore oil industry in the North Sea, so this is a big, big deal for us. But also, we're building a lot of renewables, offshore wind platforms, wave, and so forth. And uh, again, this is dangerous stuff. The average salary can go up to hundred thousand pounds a year. It's expensive. The risks are very high. So that's why it's so expensive. That's why these people get paid so much money. They're not necessarily that specialist. It's just that any one of them could die at any point. So they have to get paid a lot of danger money, we call it, in order to do this job. So you can reduce that by using drones and by using virtual reality instead. For site visits, civil engineering, again, is where you're dealing with heavy engineering, building bridges, building large buildings. And there's a lot of risks of things falling on your head hence the, the, the uh, hard hats. There's no reason why people should have to put themselves in these uh, these environments. They could be in their office and they could send a drone or one person with a 360 camera could capture this information and they could, they could have all the information they need. We'll show you an example of this shortly. Electrical, electrical insulation, the sixth most hazardous job. Again, this can be done remotely. It can be trained digitally so that before somebody even goes anywhere near a live junction box, they've already trained up very, very accurately in virtual reality so they know what they're doing before they're in a dangerous scenario. Painting, this is the fourth uh, road bridge in uh, Scotland. Now, it's a very, very dangerous place to paint and they have to, the, the myth is that uh, as soon as they finish painting one side of the bridge, they have to immediately start the other side because they, the first side needs, so it's constantly being uh, renewed. People fall off this constantly. The death rates are huge and therefore the costs are high, the insurance levels are high. If we can avoid that, we should and we can. Lorry driving, that is going to be replaced very, very soon by uh, lorry trains so that there will be uh, many, many lorries in front of each other and only the one at the front has, has a driver. The driver doesn't necessarily have to be there. We're not quite at the stage of our legal system in the UK or even anywhere in the world accepting autonomous lorries yet. Not long, but in the meantime, we can operate these remotely. And, uh, and it means that once we do get through to autonomous, we can actually have maybe one person keeping an eye on a number of autonomous lorry trains just in case something goes wrong at which point we can take over. Roofing and scaffolding, third most hazardous job. Uh, we already use drones and virtual reality, which we'll show you shortly, in order to avoid people having to go up there, particularly when it comes to installing solar panels or really anything which involves working at night. Construction again, high up construction. There's so many ways that you can plan BIM, building information modeling, and CIM, city information modeling, is technically an extension of virtual reality being brought into the construction sector. And again, there's so many things you can do with these models to design, to retrofit, to work out what's went wrong at different stages, all of which lends itself perfectly to virtual reality. Uh, you'll notice that I never got to the first most hazardous job. Can anybody, ha can anybody guess what the most hazardous job in the world is? Mining? Mining? You would think so, wouldn't you? But no, in terms of the amount of deaths per capita, per you know, maybe thousand or million people in the world, mining is actually very high because not that many people do it. So what Firefighting? Firefighting? Diving, diving, sea diving. Again, all good guesses. It's not any of these. It's farming. <laughs> farming. Farming. Yep. Uh, working with animals and working with uh, really any of the equipment that you use in farming is incredibly hazardous. There's so many different hazardous things that people do in farming, including working at height, working with volatile substances, albeit organic ones, uh, and uh, working with animals obviously is quite unpredictable. Uh, travel, the machinery, there's so many risks. And again, many of these could actually be controlled, many of this machinery certainly could actually be controlled. Anyway. 
I'll show you a quick right. How are we doing for time, Sampath? Because I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Another five minutes more, then we'll have a Q and A. Okay. Right. I'll show you this video. Is probably a relevant one. This is one of ours. Three-dimensional model capable of, what you're looking at here is a three-dimensional model capable of being viewed in virtual reality with nothing more than high-resolution photos captured by unmanned aerial vehicles or drones to create these models. As no specialist scanning hardware is required, any drone operator with a high-definition camera provide the input we need. Once these models are complete, engineers can remotely assess any number of buildings' suitability for solar panel installation accurately assessing the power generation capability of each roof surface according to direction, angle, and shading from nearby trees and buildings. In fact, as well as being far cheaper and faster than sending out specialist engineers to carry out the work in person, by eliminating human error, this approach can actually be more accurate than traditional on-site measurement methods. Most importantly, as dozens of buildings can be scanned in a single day for the first time, Busy domestic areas can realistically be assessed within tight time financial budgets. As these models can be fully manipulated, we can remove trees and buildings planned for demolition, and even add and assess buildings planned for construction using nothing more than BIM architectural planning models. On top of this, models can be used to assess damage or wear and tear to roofing, create accurate ground-level visualizations for local residents and other stakeholders, and with the addition of infrared, can even be used for heat loss assessments to help improve buildings' energy efficiency. With the time and cost savings, features and benefits of this aerial modeling approach, there are many reasons to adopt this technology in sustainable property development. So that's just one of the examples of the technology, how we use the technology here. And that was just because somebody from the solar power industry saw what we could do in terms of modeling and drone work, and said, could we use that for installation and working out the, the potential yield of solar panels, which is, and as we're very far north here, so we have to be quite careful to make sure that there's going to be a return on investment, particularly in the winter time. So we have to be careful about this. And yeah, that's just one. Another one, which I won't take you through the whole of, okay? But this is the, the Dusan Babcock example that I mentioned. So if I just click through, it talks about diverse teams working on a project. Uh, it talks about the uh, the expense and the difficulty of getting people from one location to another in order to do projects. And actually the costs of this can be in the millions per day for large uh, construction organizations and energy organizations. So instead of forcing people to travel around, particularly offshore into hazardous environments, we created a model of the demonstration room, which is in Glasgow. Uh, so this is a virtual reality model that people can move around. But then we uh, added in the ability to go into live 360 degree feeds of hazardous environments, of engineering environments in different locations. So here, suddenly they're actually in a live video. And the live video is 360, or that video can have been recorded recently, meaning that somebody who's local is, is being a live guide to a recently recorded video, which means that they can do site inspections many site inspections in a very short period of time. The kind of thing that normally would have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, lots of risk, lots of travel, lots of downtime for the professionals involved. Now all of it can be done in one day, potentially five different locations in all different parts of the globe. So the ability to save money is massive. And the ability to save carbon in terms of uh, you know, unnecessary travel is huge as well. This again, to give you an idea of what these things look like, again, the oil, oil industry and the offshore, um, the offshore renewables industry needs realism and we need it for training, we need it for safety training, we need it for engineering training. What you're looking at here, virtual reality. That could be run on an Oculus Go headset, a 200 pound headset. And you've got a level of realism which is right up there with actually being there, which I think is very important. And uh, this is underwater. Anyway. One. This is an example of the time saving involved. This was a company called Bell uh, who make helicopters. Normally it would take them anything up to six years to design a new helicopter because they'll make their designs, they'll pass them backwards and forwards to the engineers and the pilots and so forth. In this case, they designed this concept helicopter not in six years, but in six months. 
Oh. Because all that had to happen, I know, all that had to happen was that they would take a pilot, put on the virtual reality headset, and uh, the pilot would say, oh, well, I can't see properly out this window. And then the designer would say, fine, we'll just extend it a little bit. There, can you see it now? Now, that process would take seconds, whereas previously it would take days, weeks, even months. So the amount of time that's saved using virtual reality for design is massive. And the amount of money, therefore, that these kind of organizations are willing to invest in this technology is huge. And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it. Now, not to say that I would require any client of mine to have hundreds of thousands of pounds or millions of pounds to invest. The point of me starting with these big organizations with a great deal to gain and big resources is that they can pay for the development of this technology. Then once I've built it, I can pass it on to those whose needs are just as great, but whose pockets are not as deep. Education, charity, uh, healthcare, all of these kind of areas where we can reuse, repurpose this technology that these guys have paid for, and they're happy, and, uh, and make other people happy as well without breaking the bank. So that's my presentation over. Uh, I'll give the screen back to you, uh, Sampa, uh, just to so can work out to do it. Stop share. There we go. There we are. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh... Ravi? Sampath, I don't have to do the first one always, do I? <laughs> okay. Ashish, Ashish actually, Ashish, our guest, has a question. So, Ashish, could you have your video on so you can see? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Moving, moving a bit. Hi, David. Uh, question related to, can you talk a little bit about mixed reality uh, technology and its applications? Because we covered fairly well virtual reality and augmented reality, but I needed a little bit better feel for mixed reality. Where, where do we actually are? Because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of stories, but not getting a real sense of it. And, uh, <laughs> and the second uh, question on, on the follow up was that, uh, can you give us a feel for amount of effort levels and cost to actually, to actually build AR VR related content and the actual integration? Two very good questions. I have moved very quickly from just virtual reality into virtual and augmented reality. The reason for that was that I was waiting for the technology to move to the stage where you did not have to download an app for every augmented reality experience that you were going to have, because that's what destroyed QR codes in the United Kingdom. And it didn't, that didn't happen in China and Japan because they use WeChat. Everybody uses WeChat. And therefore, when you get a phone, it has WeChat on it and it had a QR code reader on it. So if you wanted to access it, there were no barriers. You just pointed your phone and it worked. And that was what I was waiting for with augmented reality. I had to do that. And now we're there. We have browser-based augmented reality. And that means that through different platforms, there's one called Vectory, which is extremely cheap, affordable, gives you accurate scale of models to about 98%. So it's a 2% tolerance in terms of scale. You can make an object appear, it reacts appropriately to the lighting in the room, and it looks like that object is in your house <laughs> next to your window. I can share some links uh, to you that we created um, on this. And that was really important because already we've got companies coming to us from all over the world, actually, uh, one just over the border, 5,000 pieces of different footwear to be yeah. augmented so that they can then use that as part of their e-commerce system. So instead of just showing a picture, they can say, okay, well, see the shoe. Yeah. Try it on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, the only problem with Vectory and with that system is the shoe doesn't do anything. Apart from scaling up and down and rotating and seeing it, it doesn't move, it's not interactive. So there are other systems like uh, 8Wall is one. Very expensive, but it's good. And, uh, and that allows you to create interactive augmented reality models which will appear in your house and so for instance canon who built uh, the, their printers division they wanted to show their printers but they wanted to show what they could do so we had to uh, create augmented reality where they could just click the user could click a link you would see the printer the printer would start printing you would hear what it sounded like see how many sheets they could print in color or black and white within a minute uh, see how it opened up, the size, scale, everything like that, and that was really what they needed. So a lot more expensive, but still not very expensive. I mean, you're talking, well, 
it's not cheap, but considering that this is the first generation, you're talking about £1,000 for a product, and then for every thousand activations, you may be talking a few more hundred pounds. So at the moment, it's still a premium product, but Vectory, we can we can roll out a product for as little as about a hundred pounds for the product to be scanned from a real world object, modeled into a digital object, placed online and held there for years. Less than a hundred pounds per product. So the costs are low. And uh, David, what about uh, from a mixed reality? I was. Uh, do you have examples about where you have combined virtual reality and augmented reality into any specific applications? Yes. The best example actually isn't one of mine, it's one from a company called uh, Vario, and Vario are based in uh, the Finland, a lot of good stuff coming out of Finland, and they partnered with Volvo, I'm working with Vario and Volvo right now on a, uh, a, a virtual reality car review, which you'll see on LinkedIn shortly, but um, what they have is that the car appears in the environment and you're using a headset called a pass-through headset. So instead of being like these glasses where you've got lenses that you can see through and a little projector projecting onto the back of the lens, what you've got is something more akin to a virtual reality headset. So you're looking at you're looking at two screens, but the two screens are seeing the world around you. So then what you can have is, as you have in the Vario setup, the Volvo car appears in your study to scale, reacting to the light. But then you can actually make a whole new environment appear around it. And the video example shows, I believe it's, a, it's an actual city street in a, the old town somewhere in Seville in Spain. And now you're in virtual reality. You've moved from uh, augmented reality straight into virtual reality seamlessly. And what you can do then is you can show the car moving. You can show how it responds to different terrain different speeds, different weather conditions, in a way that augmented reality doesn't show you. It shows you it in the context of your own home and your own driveway, but not in the context of the object actually being used. So I suspect that there's going to be a final future for mixed reality. There's going to be a seamless combination of virtual and augmented reality. Fully David, with all these... Uh, Ashish, uh, we'll take some other questions because other people also have asked a lot of questions. Sure, sure, These are good sure, questions. Yeah. sure go on. <laughs> yeah. We'll just, if this time after it, we'll take it. So let's just finish these guys. Uh, Ravi, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, David, this is regarding haptic feedback. Yes. Uh, I would believe that when you have long distance medical assistances to do surgery, that would possibly be where haptic feedback would play a good role. Am I reasonably right in my presumption? You are. You are. All right. Are now, yes. leaving from that, uh, can somebody do the same uh, thing for fine art, say like play the violin or a mandolin with haptic feedback? I mean, sitting across the globe. That's a lovely idea. This is what I love about this, um, this, this discipline, is that I get to play with the technology, but the people that come up with the ideas for how to use it are you. And I have not heard of that being used for, for music. For, I've seen it being used for fine art, but not for telepresence. Creating art in the virtual reality environment, yes, I've seen that. But then using your virtual reality and haptics controllers to control a robot so that it creates real world art in another location or real music in another location, I've never seen that. But yes, you could absolutely do that. Um, and I love that idea. <laughs> I want to make that real now that you've told me about it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Vishwajit, any question? I'm absolutely fine. Vishwajit? No. Actually, uh, we practically encounter VR in our real estate business when a lot of developers are now actually showing the apartments and the view outside the apartments by giving the VR feel to the clients. So what advancement you see happening in that? In the, uh, in the example that I showed, is that what you're asking? So like real estate, actually people can have a feel what view they will have from the apartment, from kitchen, from hall, etc. So That's what right. We use, uh, there's a few different ways of doing this. There's one which is this. more of a kind of a 360 degree video or 360 degree walkthrough where you're moving from point to point to point and you can look around in any different environment. 
but what I'm ex and that means that you can look out the window, you can see, uh, you know, what, what the view is going to be. You can actually interact with um, different objects there. You can see what kind of heating system or air conditioning system the place has. You can see a video of that. And that's just using something called a Matterport system. Those are very, very cheap and they're used very frequently in the real estate world, particularly in the United States. I'm using it for hotels and hospitality and kind of higher value properties in the United Kingdom. But that's mainly because there's a difference in how uh, realtors, how people who are selling real estate get paid in America and the UK, they get paid a lot more in America. So they're happy to invest more money in this kind of technology, whereas here, they don't get paid that much. So it has to be high value properties or things like hotels. However, that's only of use if the house has already been built. If the house hasn't been built yet, you can't mm -hmm. scan it, so you can't see what the view is. So what we do is we use BIM, we use the as a building information modeling to create a 3D model of the property. We use drones to capture the environment around that model, you know, the real world environment. And then we can not only take people into their apartment, which hasn't been built yet, so that they can see the view as it would be from the window in the virtual reality apartment, but also for people living nearby who maybe, maybe are worried about that building being built that may block the view or something like that, they can see what it will actually look like. We call that here stakeholder engagement. Probably call it the same thing. Very, very useful for planning and stakeholder engagement. Wow. Thank you so yeah. much. Great. Thank you. Uh, David, we are out of time right now. And uh, uh, we will be moving into the breakout rooms. Uh, so whoever is there online, I've just created one breakout room for everyone. So you can log into the breakout rooms. And uh, we... Thanks. Uh, what an experience. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, David. Program. Thank you. Yeah.